All right, we're live. Um, yep. Welcome to the Big East Coast Podcast. Doing it on uh, Tuesday today. Uh, it was just easier with the schedule yesterday and everything. So, uh, yeah, a lot has happened in the last week. Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of traction, a lot of movement. Uh, mostly at mostly at the top of the conference, I would say the bottom of the conference has performed pretty much how uh, many have expected it to, with the exception of one team. And I'm sure we'll go into that because they picked up an upset victory yesterday. Uh, later on, but yeah, a, lot, a lot's gone on. The Gavit games have come and gone. Uh, it was an even four four split again. Again, second straight year that's that's been the case. It was good this year, though. I I remember it, and I know because it just happened. I remember it being a lot better than last year. Yeah, definitely. We had you know the the really good game between Maryland and Georgetown last year in College Park. But besides besides that, you know, you had a you had a lopsided game with Villanova and Nebraska. Um, you had a lopsided game with Marquette and Iowa, from what I remember as well. Uh, Xavier, Michigan was very lopsided too in the favor of the Musketeers. So there were a lot of blowouts last year and a lot of close games this time around, which was yes. a lot, a lot more in, of an enjoyable experience. Oh yeah, and you got Creighton being, you know, I mean, receiving in to beat down at Assembly Hall in Bloomington too. So yeah, yeah, and I mean, then this year, you know, you had probably six good games. Mm-hmm. DePaul Rutgers wasn't very good. But um, Providence Ohio State wasn't great. No, but I think the other six were all good to very good. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I mean that's that's what you're looking for. Um, you know, Villanova Purdue was a good game. Butler Northwestern ended up being a really good game. Yes, definitely. And Northwestern actually beat Texas yesterday, so that might be a big win for Butler down the line. Yeah, absolutely, and the fact that, you know, they played them pretty competitively down down the rest of the way shows that, you know, maybe that wasn't just, you know, Butler struggling. Northwestern might actually be a solid all around. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know if we need to go into every game specifically. Um, obviously, Villanova-Purdue was about as good as advertised. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Purdue's bigs are legit. Villanova's guards are legit. Um, I think Josh Hart, that was his first good game of the week. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he had 24. And uh, really, I think Darrell Reynolds really held his own, too, for going up against, you know, the guys that he went up against. He, he, did, what he, he did what he could. I mean, Purdue's bigs ended up between Haas and Swanigan – for 42 points because, you know, there was a while where, you know, late in the second half when Purdue needed points, they were just going to Isaac Haas every time. Yeah, he was pretty much unstoppable, which is what you were expecting um, yeah. when you have, you know, no, no one to really guard a guy who's, you know, seven foot seven foot tall and then some. So yeah. that wasn't too surprising of a result there. Yeah. And then, um, you know, Georgetown, Maryland um, – Oh man, it was, cer- it was certainly entertaining, but just in a negative aspect for Georgetown, who flipped up and was up seventy-two to fifty-six, twenty-two seconds, with twenty-eight seconds left, and wound up losing seventy-six, seventy-five. So, yeah, there were just a lot of mental errors that you know did them in, and allowed for the Terps to sneak up and get the victory for get the get the victory off their hands. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Georgetown's lucky that we're doing this today and not yesterday because I think we probably will have nicer things to say about them today. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, one win doesn't completely absolve them of the mental errors that they had last week, but, you know, it's certainly a little bit more comforting with the fact that they did take down Oregon yesterday in the Maui Open. Yeah, but um, I think Creighton-Wisconsin might have ended up being the best game of the uh, whole slate in terms of Gavit games just because, you know, Creighton got the big lead off the uh, jump, and then they got down. And, uh, you know, it was, it was real back and forth the whole way. I don't know. I think I think Villanova-Purdue was a little bit more enthralling I because I know Creighton, obviously, they pulled, they pulled way ahead of them, and they won by 12. 
and it looks like from the looks of it, Creighton did pull away for quite a ways there. So I think Purdue going over is more okay. exciting. I mean, they did pull away at the end. Exactly, yeah. Because going over Purdue was pretty much tight for the entirety of it. They only won by three. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we talked about Butler Northwestern. It was a good game throughout. Um, yeah. Which, and then we had Wednesday. Was it Wednesday? Last Wednesday was – no, last Wednesday was Butler Northwestern. Thursday was one of the uh, – one of the worst days for the conference in a while. Well, except for – Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, Georgetown lost. Um, Big East blew their 3-1 Gavit Games lead. Well, technically blew it before Seton Hall put it to 4-3, but still. Yeah. Um, Michigan-Marquette was never a close game, which was surprising. Nope. Michigan kind of shot the lights out at uh, at the Garden. They looked a lot more comfortable than Marquette, which I guess makes sense because there's a little bit more experience on – Wolverine side, then Marquette side, they still kind of have to get their, you know, their act together, so, so, so to speak. Um, Providence refused to take the lead against Ohio State. Kind of just hung out within the three to five range for most of the game. Except when they were down. They were down pretty big near the half, and then they came back, but they refused to, you know, take the next step, which wasn't great. Um, Talked about DePaul Rutgers. Uh, Rutgers. Rutgers 4-0 right now, by the way. Um, strange new world. But, uh, you know, DePaul couldn't handle the size that Rutgers brought. And really, it wasn't even the big guys that did him in. Uh, you know, it was the guards that did him in, but just killed him on the rebounds. So I'm a little confused here. You said that we weren't going to go through every game, but we're going through every game. Right now. Yeah, no, we, we probably shouldn't. Um, but yeah, Gav games ended in tie. Um, well, wait, wait, hold, hold on. If we're if we're gonna, we're, we can't skip over the fact that Seton Hall did what they did to Iowa because that was probably the most impressive performance out of anybody in the entire Gav games. I know you're not trying to go over every game, but you can't skip over Seton Hall's performance because no. that that was as that was as impressive as, of a game that I've seen from the Pirates in quite some time. So yeah, I mean, uh, and to get all the production like that from a freshman and Miles Powell, you know, uh, that, was, that was, and I mean, it wasn't all the production, you know, they had three guys at 20 points, but I didn't expect Powell to be the leading scorer. Yeah, it, certainly that was a little bit surprising, but I think it's really just showing the fact that Seton Hall is a very deep team. Uh, they have a lot of length to their advantage and their veterans are playing very well too. Okay, there's a lot of feedback going on there. On their end. Yeah, um, you might want to go with your headphones. I think it's you, maybe. But um, yeah, no, that's a that's a big win for a Seton Hall team who, uh, you know, like we talked about last week, they blew away their competition the first two games, but they didn't really play anyone, and now to have a win under Iowa against Iowa under their belt going into a tournament where they're gonna have to face, you know. Florida for sure, and then maybe Gonzaga again, and a couple other good teams. It's nice to have that experience and that confidence just going in. Yeah, and I, I really like this Pirates team, and I would go so far as to say that when they face Xavier, specifically because of how they match up with them, I think they're going to destroy them if they keep playing at this current rate because Xavier won't be able to handle anybody that they have down low, and Seton Hall is just throwing a bunch of – there right now, so – um, I think the Pirates definitely hold a matchup edge over them, and that that could get ugly if the Pirates play up to par. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I voted Seton Hall second in our power rankings behind Villanova, so I'm I'm very very high on them right now, especially after that win over Iowa. Yeah, I think they ended up fourth in the power rankings, but I had them second too, I believe. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's obviously a lot of people that are high on Creighton, and for good reason, obviously. But I think I think Seton Hall has been slightly more impressive in their offense, you know, doing what they're doing. 
but they did score 31 points in the final 10 minutes of that game at I- at Iowa. So to do that within that time frame, especially on the road, was incredibly impressive. I know Iowa's not like you know the the best team in the Big Ten, but yeah, it's it's still you, Carver Hawkeye is a very you know it's, it's a decent place to play. So for the Pirates with a relatively you know, new group of people um, with a good good chunk of continuity too to go and do that was, was pretty impressive. Yeah, and I mean if you look at the uh, the road games that the Big East had to play against the Big Ten, they they won the two hardest places to play. Yep. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's particularly close either. I mean Minnesota's not. Yeah, I mean, Minis- the, the barn is – when Minnesota is pretty good, um, it's it's somewhat hostile. I mean, it wasn't going to be super hostile on a Friday night, but – No. There was still a decent crowd in, on that game, if I remember correctly, but – Yeah. Mackey is obviously a very, very tough place to blame for going over to do that. Was impressive, and for Seton Hall to do that at Carver-Hawkeye was impressive as well. Exactly. Um, and then – yeah, I mean we're we're not gonna go into St. John's, Minnesota. I think you know the Red Storm still have a lot to work on. They're gonna be better than last year. They're more fun than last year already. But you know, there's still things that they need to work on. They're still a young team. You know, they're probably not gonna beat a not very good Michigan State team to well, a not very good so far Michigan State team. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's another game that you can take and learn a lot from, and I don't think they're going to drop games to, uh, you know, some of the bad teams that they dropped games to last year, like Fordham, who they play again, or NGIT, who they don't play, but, you know, someone of that caliber. Yeah, their their transition defense and defense in general still needs a little bit of work. Their, their, metrics, their metrics look good right now. Um, for the most part, they are not in the red on Ken Palm. They are in, like, the top – 150 in a majority of categories um, at the at the bare minimum because I'm seeing that their just defense efficiency is 65th in the country, which is a pretty good mark at this point. Um, they're not allowing a lot of two-point makes, which makes sense considering they have a lot of size. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're really – I wouldn't say they're, they're really struggling, but their weakest point looks to be the fact that, you know, they're not defending the three super well. It's more so very average. Yeah. At this point, which again, makes sense to a youthful team, not everyone's going to be very exuberant on defense quite yet. But uh, metric wise, and this probably has a lot to do with the teams that they've faced. Um, they've been doing a de- they've been doing a decent job, and Minnesota, the best team that they've faced so far, um, gave them you know the, tough, the toughest thing to handle. And even with that said, they still shot like under fifty like, percent. Yeah. From the from the field. So Yeah. It's 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 looking better than it was last year. Yeah, I mean they're they're at number ninety in Ken Palm overall right now, and I don't think they ever cracked, you know, over one eighty or whatever last year. Um after the start of the year. They started around one fifty, but they were never in the top one hundred, certainly. No, they weren't. I'm looking. I'm looking at it right now. They did start at 150. The highest point that they ever got was 142nd, which yeah. is after their win over Rutgers. And then they spent time, you know, down like 150s, 170s, even in the low, like even in the high 200s. Yeah, they finished and, at two. They finished at 236. Yeah, and they're not going to go from 90 to 236. So there's improvement yeah. this year already. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. And they're the second lowest Big East team at 90, so that goes to show, you know, how big the conference is uh, in terms of, you know, talent. Um, DePaul slipped under 200 the other day, but they they got back. They're not very good. They, uh, I'm not really breaking any news there, but, man. Well, I, you know, they, they did look okay against Milwaukee. Uh, Garrett and Kane certainly came to play uh, in their own right. Yeah, it was. I mean, Garrett had been struggling to get going, but um, they just—I don't know. They need—they need bigs, and the only way that it's going to happen is just by getting them rotation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think when Peter Rickbosch comes back, that'll help. Yeah. Um, maybe when Levi Cook gets a little more comfortable playing, that'll help. But for now. Really, just a work in progress, and they have to play a pretty good Missouri State team 
tomorrow night. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So, the three Feast Week tournaments that happened already uh, at the Big East swept. Um, Villanova looked a little sluggish in their first game and then figured it out for the next two. Mm-hmm. Not a whole ton to talk about there, except for Josh Hart having 30 against Wake Forest. Yeah. A pretty good Wake Forest team, too. Um, that was probably the best team they played all weekend, and they beat them by the most. Yeah, the, the Demon Deacons under Danny Manning certainly look improved over the over what they were before he got there. Uh, they've been, you know, it's not it's not Chris Paul's Wake Forest Demon Deacons anymore. It's, it's, it's been a team that's been quite a lot of transition down in Winston-Salem, but they look to be on the up and up now. But, yeah, Villanova really handled them pretty well. Yeah, I mean, you know, the UCF game was close because they have a literal giant. Yeah. Villanova didn't have anyone that could stop him. I mean, he Correct. he was ten for ten from the field, and you know, twenty points, thirteen rebounds. So I'm surprised they ever lose. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, that was Villanova. They won their preseason tournament. It's just what they do. Favored in every game the rest of the way this year, which obviously doesn't mean they're gonna go. You know, thirty. Four and oh, what is the regular season? Thirty-four would be, yeah, yes, because there's six tournaments yeah. like to win. So no, I mean it obviously doesn't mean they're going to go thirty-four and oh just because they're favored, but it helps. I mean, and I it's tough to see them losing a non-conference game at this point. I mean Notre Dame maybe, but I don't see it. No, it's it's tough to, it's really tough to envision that right now, or at least just to, to pluck a loss or two. So really, what everyone's rooting for at this point, and it's going to be tough because Creighton doesn't have really a loss that I see him taking the rest of the non-conference either, and they play Villanova at the uh, Century Link, the second game of Big East play. But Villanova opens against DePaul, and Creighton opens against Seton Hall. So yeah. So Creighton would have to get past Seton Hall, which I, I'm not, I'm not sure if they can because that matchup kind of does lean towards Seton Hall, but but it is in Omaha. It is in Omaha, so that does put that does put it back somewhat in their favor from that regard, from a home court standpoint. But I mean, New Year's Eve undefeated Creighton against undefeated Villanova in Omaha. That'd be pretty fun. It's not a night game, but still, you know, it would still be pretty fun. Yeah. Um, Xavier almost lost to Missouri, which you shouldn't do. Yeah, um, that was a little, that was a little eye-opening. Uh, they couldn't really stop Frankie Hughes or Terrence Phillips, who were both pretty dynamic in that game. The, um, the only, the only people able to stop Missouri in that game was Missouri, ultimately. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, themselves, they probably should have won. Exactly, yeah. And I, I mean, through through much of the the tournament that they had down in Orlando, I mean, yes, they did win, but they did have their fair share of struggles. A lot of foul trouble. A lot of foul a lot. trouble. A lot of uh, inefficient offense. Um, yeah. I mean, they'll be fine. You know, I'm not I'm not worried about them. Uh, you know, it's going to be hard when they have to go to Baylor. Ideally, yeah. they will have all hands on deck for that, maybe, because it looks like Kaiser Gates is about to be back, and maybe this Miles Davis thing is reaching a conclusion, possibly, based on things you see. But, you know, I mean, and they're, they're going to be a different team when Miles Davis comes back, because Edmund Sumner really isn't a very good point guard, in terms of, like, a pure point guard, in terms of where he could be on the court if there was a pure point guard playing point guard. I don't want to say yeah. he's good. He is good, obviously. But his role is a little bit better at the two instead of everyone having to slide down a position. Correct. Also, he's going to start hitting threes eventually. He hasn't done that yet this year, and uh, he will at some point. Really? I hope at least. You could – well, I mean, he's one for 11 right now. That's not going to – yeah, I mean, he he was only a th- but he was only a thirty percent shooter from three last year, which I mean would be an obvious improvement. But 
Yeah. Um, no, I mean, you know, Xavier won the tournament because of Sumner blew it in Makura. And that's how they're going to win games. If you've got to get yeah, exactly. from those guys. And if anyone else can give you a little bit. I think Tyreek Jones had a pretty nice tournament. Um, did a lot of things well. While maybe not scoring, but, you know, he affects the game in a lot of ways. Um, and they looked they looked real good against Clemson. Yeah, they looked they looked pretty good against Clemson. I will I will say that. And against Northern Iowa, I mean, they did the thing out of halftime that we saw them do last year at Orlando, where they just beat the team down. They did. I they I'm just in it more. They did. Yeah. You know. I was just concerned with their three point shooting numbers because they only went five for twenty two, and the only guys that were really produ- the guy who was really producing consistently on offense was Trayvon Blewett, and even he was two for ten from three. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at their three point numbers from last year, um, obviously Miles Davis will play a role there too, but um, most guys that were there last year that are there this year who shot a decent amount of threes, you know, are were ended up better over the course of the season than they have been so far this year. So, you know, it's a lot of regression that still has to work itself out. I mean, they're five and zero, so you know they're they're not a you know pretty five and zero or whatever you want to call it, but they're five and zero. So, yeah. But I, I do think that they may have been a little bit overvalued just because of their you know three headed yeah. attack between Makura and Sumner and Blewett. But we'll we'll see how it plays out. Um, and then Creighton hit a pair of beatdowns before uh, having a little bit of a challenge last night. Yeah, they they were uh, they were taken to task by those darn cheating bears from Ole Miss, um, but they were able to prevail and win eighty six to seventy seven. Prior to that, they scored over one hundred points twice against Washington State and North Carolina State. Wazoo, of course, being the black hole that they are for college basketball, did not put up much of a fight. And um, the duel between Dennis Smith and Maurice Watson went as went pretty well, but um, despite the fact that NC State had two players that scored over twenty points, they still could not muster up the attack that Creighton had because Creighton had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven players in double figures, and Tyler Clement had seven points himself, so he was three away from being in double figures too. And Toby Heckner had eight. Yeah, I mean Creighton has to kind of work on the defense a little bit. They do. They but do. it'll come. I mean, you have a lot of opportunities to do that. You know, Maryland, not a very good team. Yeah. Buffalo will be an interesting task in them, but they do play them at home. Um, same thing with Akron. Uh, they should be able to, t- to take care of business against Nebraska. But, yeah, like you, like you mentioned, there should be some opportunities for them to shore up their defense. But, you know, if they start – you know, playing bad defensively against some of those teams that we mentioned, then you know maybe they'll maybe we'll be a little bit more concerned. With that. Yeah, but they certainly do have the pieces offensively to you know go shot for shot with anybody. Also, in typical Creighton fashion, they're just killing people from long range. Yep, yep. That that's just that's what they do. So, and I mean they weren't able to do it the last couple of years. So for them to be back to doing that, and obviously they're at fifty percent right now. They're not going to be at fifty percent all year. No, but if they if they shoot like they did when you know they were twenty seven and eight back in the first year and they were in the Big East and shoot forty one point five percent from three, which was the top mark that year, then you know they'll be pretty darn good. Yeah, and uh, Justin Patton and Marcus Foster have been really good. Yes, um, both of them. Obviously, Maurice Watson's good. Kyrie Thomas has been good. So they got they have a lot of guys. They have a lot of weapons. They do. Um, they do. So. Yeah. Um, so those three teams won. I think we all expected it. Yes. Um, now this week, Georgetown. <laughs> Georgetown. Um, they're, they're confusing again. They are. They are. They're very confusing. This is the second year we've gone through this nonsense with them. So uh, they beat Oregon yesterday. Um, Almost get almost gagged it away, but the hole that the Ducks dug themselves into was just far too much for them to climb out of. 
Uh, Hoya's offense was pretty good. LJ, LJ Peak had probably his worst game of the year, and even then he scored in double figures. So it shows you, you know, what the kind of output that they can overcome. Um, and Ronnie Pryor was excellent again. So, yeah, I, I mean, George, I don't know what to make of the Hoyas, and I won't make, know what to make of them if, even if they win tonight against Wisconsin, you know, because they just they don't make sense. There is a chance that Oregon's not very good, though. I think Oregon is a team that just right now needs to figure themselves out with getting Dylan Brooks back for the first time yesterday and do, figuring out what they're doing with, you know, Peyton Pritchard and Dylan Ennis. So they can't, I, like, they can't shoot, though. Yeah, but again, this this team was very. I don't, I don't, I'm going to leave this short, but this is a team that shot very well last year with basically the same group, and Villanova didn't shoot well last year. Remember, they were terrible from three. Look what happened with them. Yeah. So, so I, th- I think they're just they're off to a slump from a shooting perspective, and I think they're going to you know eventually shoot themselves out of it. No, I think ultimately it's going to go down as a really good win for Georgetown. Yeah, but. They also had a really good win against Wisconsin last year. So, yeah. or I think it was Wisconsin that they beat. Look, if Georgia yeah. wants everyone to forget about Arkansas State, beat Wisconsin tonight, and then beat North Carolina on Thursday. Yep. Thursday, Tuesday? Wednesday? Yep. One of those days. Whenever they play North Carolina, as long as North Carolina beats um, whatever not great team they're playing today, UConn. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's actually UConn because I don't think UConn won. I don't remember. I'm not going to pull up the thing and we look unprepared. They're playing, they're playing Oklahoma State. Well, the point still stands. I mean, Oklahoma State's not particularly good. They're they're pretty. They're all right. They're all right. Bill Forte is still. Is Brian Nash still there? Phil Forte is. Well, Brian Nash isn't, but Phil Forte is still there. Because Phil Forte is the new uh, Perry Ellis of the Big 12. I was going to go with Brady Heslip, but Perry Ellis certainly does work. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, let's take a break from the analysis here. Just real quick, you have five teams undefeated still. Who do you think loses next? Um, I think the easy – Let's see. So you have Villanova, Xavier, Butler, Creighton, and Seton Hall. Seton Hall plays Florida. Yeah, it's not going to be Villanova. I mean, they're playing Charleston. At yeah. the it's not going to be them. It's probably not going to be Creighton because they play Loyola, Maryland. They're not a very good team. Butler plays Vandy, and then if they win, probably Arizona. See, I would I would be worried about Butler against Vanderbilt, but Vanderbilt last night dropped a very winnable game to Bucknell at home. Yeah. The Bucknell team that Butler absolutely annihilated this past Saturday. So I'm not sure if I'm going to say Butler, even though, like I, even though Vanderbilt is what they are. It, I like Seton Hall, but they, of anybody, I guess the projection would probably be that they're probably going to lose a neutral site game or a nu- neutral site game. Yeah. To Florida, it's basically a semi away, basically a semi away game because that game is in is in Gator territory. Unless you trust them to beat Florida, and you don't think Butler can beat Arizona, I mean, I I think just the, the easy the easy pick would be to say you know Seton Hall, maybe the sneaky picks. I guess I'll keep doing this. Um, if Northern Iowa plays better this time against Xavier, they could knock them off at home, but that would be like the second least the second most possible possible outcome here. I think Seton Hall is the easy choice to say, oh, they're going to probably drop a game, but even though I'm so high on them. Villanova's beating College of Charleston. Yeah. Even though they're kind of all right. Um, Xavier's probably beating Northern Iowa at Sintas. Butler's probably beating a a mediocre Vanderbilt team, and Creighton absolutely should beat a Loyola team that's not very good at all. And Seton Hall is playing a Florida team that right now is ranked 11th on Kempom, who has an incredibly good defense. So, which basically kind of, you know, they they have the bodies to match up with Seton Hall. Yeah, I mean, they haven't been tested yet, but... Yeah, they have, they have, they've definitely not been tested. Uh, their best test yesterday was against a pretty decent Belmont team, and they won by 17. 
So, and fun, fun, fun fact about the Gators, I don't know if you've checked their schedule, by the way. They've yet to play at the O'Connell Center. Dumb. All of all of their games have, have been in Jacksonville. Wow. Why? I or I'm sorry, not not every game, because they played two games in Jacksonville. They played in Lakeland against St. Bonaventure, and they played in Tampa last night against against Belmont. I don't know what this scheduling quirk is all about. I should, probably should because I I run it run an SEC blog, but yeah, their their first technical home game is not until they play Little Rock on December 21st. Are they still renovating? <laughs> they might be renovating the O'Connell Center because it's going to be under a new name from the looks of it. It's going to be the Ex- Exact Tech Arena. Yeah, I think they're still renovating. Yeah, so, yeah, fun little thing about that. They have yet to play in Gainesville, and they're still, you know, four and up. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a year where Florida is good again. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to really like this matchup and as we're kind of turning into previewing games now as we're transitioning here. This was, that, was a good, that was a good segue to talk about who we think is going to drop That's, the game first. Um, like I said, I think Seton Hall is going to have a bit of a matchup issue here. Well, matchup issue in that they're facing a team that is built somewhat like them because John, John Agbunu – I hope I pronounced that right. I probably didn't. I probably butchered it. Is six foot eleven. He's been very good uh, from a rebounding perspective. Very good shot blocker as well. Um, good shooter inside. He's made forty eight point three percent of the twenty nine attempts that he's had. And then they've got guys like Canyon Barry, uh, Kevon Allen has been one of their best players so far. Uh, Devin Robinson's been very good from three. And inside, he's shooting 65% on 22-point attempts. Uh, which, by the way, going away here, did you see how many uh, two-point attempts that Bronson Koenig has missed this year? Probably not very many. Two. He missed two. That's it. He's taken, yeah, he's seven, just... taken 17 two-point attempts. He's missed two of them. And, yeah, so F- Florida is going to be a very tough matchup for Seton Hall. I, I, I don't know. Like, it's, it's going to be a close game regardless. But that game's going to be pretty fun. But, like I said, if I had to pick anyone that's going to lose next, it would be Seton Hall based on the fact that they face the toughest opponent. And they're playing them in the Gators' home state down in Kissimmee. Yeah. So. And then if they win, they get uh, probably Gonzaga. Who again? I think they could, you know, they could lose to them too. So yeah, it's it's gonna be a tough tournament for them. Which means that they're totally gonna sweep through it <laughs> because we're talking about this so much. Um, yeah, and then Butler probably will go one and one in Vegas. Mm-hmm. I don't think they're gonna beat Arizona. Now they probably they probably don't have the pieces to do that, but you know they Butler has certainly shocked us more often than they haven't the past few years. So. Nothing. Nothing is really off the table. They have their fair share of top ten wins in these tournaments. They do. That's um, why. That's why I'm saying. Like they, they have certainly North done their Carolina job. Twice, actually. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. So. So I mean, you never know. Nope. You know. Don't. Um. See who else? Providence. I think they played Memphis. They open against Memphis. Memphis was not very good. Memphis took a really bad loss to. Um... Oh no, they didn't lose. My bad. No, I, I still think Providence should beat Memphis though. So. Yeah. They um, should. Tubby Smith, new coach of Memphis, um, replacing the. Josh Passner, who went to Georgia Tech. Yep. Um, and if Providence wins against Memphis, they play. What's this tournament called? I know it's in Destin, Lake or Emerald Coast. There it is. Yeah. All right. So if they beat Memphis, well, you know, win or lose, they play Virginia or Iowa. So. 
really nice chance for Providence to uh, make some noise. And I think I think they've been pretty good, um, all things considered. Yeah, for a team that lost two guys to the NBA and also Junior Lamamba, I believe that he's mm-hmm. he's departed since. For a team that's done all that, they've they've looked yeah they've looked they've looked okay. They've looked about what I've expected them to look like. Defensively, they've been pretty good. They haven't. They had their they had their struggles in the beginning against Grambling State, though I think that may have had to do with the short turnaround that they had and the fact that it was a very early game in the day, and they were just they kind of just had to work the kinks out. Uh, yeah, for for what they have right now and for the situation that they're in right now, they've they've looked they've looked okay. Kieran Cartwright's been really good. Yeah, yeah, Cart- Cartwright has been has been very good. So is so is Bullock. Bullock is shooting very well from three. So is Fazekas again, as one might expect him to. Hmm. Yeah. So I mean, we'll see. I mean, it's it's still a little too early to get a good read on this Providence team. Yeah, I think we'll know more about them in around January and February. And Rob, I know you're talk you uh you were talking about how Oregon is bad. They're well, they're they're doing what they should be doing against a very bad Tennessee team right now, Howie. Yeah, well, it was tied at halftime. I don't think Tennessee scored since the half actually. Cause was, no, they they have not. Um, I think I saw that. They're on like now like an eighteen to one run, Oregon that is. Since sure. like since like the late late in the first half. So Rick Barnes in tournaments, man. Tennessee in general is a terrible team. So yeah, they're this, not. it's 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 uh good for the ducks that they're doing that. Anyway, enough of the Pac twelve. Back to the big east. Like you were saying, Providence has been very good so far, uh, for what they have. And they should be able to, you know, make noise in the Emerald Emerald Coast class. Yeah. Um, and then we have St. John's in the battle for Atlantis. Yeah, I mean. Uh, well, St. John's probably isn't going to win this tournament. Hopefully they can pick up wins against them. I mean, Old Dominion, beatable team if they draw them. Um, I think VCU would maybe be a team they could match up well against. LSU. Um, yeah, they, they should be able to beat LSU if they're going to beat anybody. As long as you avoid Louisville, which Louisville plays Old Dominion, so they're probably going to be in the winner's bracket where St. John's is probably not going to beat Michigan State. I mean, if they beat Michigan State, anything else that happens in the tournament is, <laughs> you know, whatever. If, if they beat Michigan State, then we are going to have to do some reevaluation of Michigan State where they're at right now. Well, Michigan State should have lost to um, – The Florida Gulf Coast at home, but there was a stupid error by, by the clock operator. Well, man, you know the- – <laughs> They're not really good at sports anymore, so they need all the help they can get. <laughs> no, they're not. Um, yeah, maybe that's why Oregon lost because Oregon football somehow beat Utah. And both teams can't be good at the same time. Um, but, yeah, one thing that I'm noticing about Michigan State right now in the early goings, and this is probably going to change over time, boy, they are shooting terrible at free throws. Yeah. Oh, they are sec. They're second to worst in the country right now in free throws. They're only making fifty four point one percent of them. Ugh. So, assuming St. John's loses tomorrow night, they would play probably VCU. Yeah. Assuming they would beat them, so again, that's winnable. Yeah, v- I mean VCU is a VCU is a good team, but they're not. <sighs> I mean, I don't know if they're necessarily that much more beatable. I think they might be better than Michigan State is at this at to this point at least. I mean, they haven't beaten anybody, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in a perfect world, St. John's could get two wins here. I'm pro- I, w- I would probably project one. But if one of the wins is against Michigan State, it doesn't really matter what they do the rest of the time. Yeah. I'm not um, going to call a shot, though. That would, be, that would be outrageous. It'll probably end up being Michigan State-Louisville. Which would be a fun match. Yeah. Um. You know, this is the second straight year St. John's is just in a ridiculous tournament. Yeah, which, you know, credit to St. John's for being willing to put themselves in this position. Uh, not a lot of teams would, you know, be so daring enough to pit their teams in tough tournament fields. But well, the one last year was probably scheduled before they were bad, but yeah, this one. I mean, yeah, I mean, and this one certainly, you know, you could kind of you know, see what was on the horizon there at St. John's, so... I, I still think it's a, it's a credit to them. They don't necessarily have to accept these invites to these tournaments. So, oh, yeah. and I mean, you know, they're doing the thing where they play Penn State at the Garden, and yeah. they're doing, you know, 
they're doing what they can to not only, you know, play some pretty good teams, but also it obviously helps recruiting a lot too. Yeah. You know, um, I also didn't realize that their logo here, the one they use on the tournament bracket at least, the uh, the T is kind of in the J. Yeah. No, oh, yeah. It's a, that's, that's pretty cool. It's a quirk. Yeah. Now you'll probably never be able to unsee that. Oh, yeah. It's like the FedEx thing. <laughs> um, for these? Yeah. I mean, more or less. There's some other games going on this week, too. None of them are particularly good. No, not really. Um, they shouldn't be noteworthy. Unless they no- are. If they're noteworthy, then something went wrong. Yeah. And we'll leave it yeah, at that. Um, Arkansas State, by the way, I didn't want to talk about it, but uh, they had a 2% chance of winning per Ken Palm. And they won. Yeah. So that was that was a bigger upset than Radford or Florida Gulf Coast or yeah. – yeah, so. that was uh, – and the fact that it happened on campus at McDonough Arena was that much more embarrassing. So you just have to hope that, you know, Georgetown doesn't continue to pull off such feats. Yes. Um, oh, by the way, Marquette might be in a little bit of trouble. They really could have used a win in New York. We didn't I, talk I, about that. Yeah, I mean, I honestly think that, you know – I think this is just a team that's trying to figure it out. I think with how they lost to Pitt, it's probably worse than actually losing to Pitt. Yeah, that wasn't that wasn't the greatest way to lose. Um, but like, no. like I said, I, I think this you know certainly is just a team that's trying to figure it out. Yeah, but I mean they're they're in a position now where they probably need to win out the non conference, which includes going to Georgia, who you know whatever, and. Uh, you know, a pretty decent Wisconsin team. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think losing to Michigan and Pitt is bad. I just think that, you know, it just puts them in a bit of a bind where they have to, you know, do more, cultivate more work now. I mean, look, if they're 18 and 12 going into the Big East tournament, like Ken Palm has them, need at least, at least one win, probably two. Um, but even then... Yeah. They were at 20 last year, I believe, and it didn't – yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know. They need to – they need their wins to be good wins. So they need to beat – they probably need to beat Wisconsin. They probably need to beat Georgia. And by probably, I mean definitely. And it would help pick up a uh, Big East win or two against – probably against not going to happen against Villanova, but, you know, Seton Hall or yeah. Xavier – yeah, exa- exactly. So they they would need to beat Seton Hall and or Xavier. Um, so they, they they just they they dug themselves into a hole. I just think overall this is a team that's just trying to to figure it out, figure out what they're doing with you know the new pieces that they have. Uh, some of the some of the, some of the players need to perform a little bit better. Uh, yeah. Reinhardt Reinhardt specifically has been very very bad offensively. Um, yeah, there's I mean, not really much good things to say about a guy who's. Uh, effective field goal percentage and true shooting percentages are both under forty percent. Yeah. So he he de- he definitely needs to play a lot better because he's a black hole offensively right now, and he should and he has been a major contributor for them. He's been accounted for in a lot of possessions, and if he's doing that badly, then he sh- probably should not be getting so many possessions and not be getting so much time. No, I agree. He should probably be passing that passing that buck off to somebody else who can do better. Um, before we move on to questions, do you want to talk about Joe Lunardi's bracket from the other day? Uh, yeah, if you, if you want to spend some, some time talking about that, we can make something out of it. Um, six Big East teams were in. I, That's fair. Uh, Georgetown was in, but this was 17th, and they lost to Arkansas State on the – Seventeenth, uh, so yeah, so I doubt. And they were one of the last four in, so it's safe to assume that they might not be in anymore. But yeah, you know, regardless, um, had Villanova moving up. They were always a one, but he had a moving up to the one in the East, which would mean Buffalo and then Madison Square Garden, 
And really, if that's their draw, they're going to Phoenix. Yeah, definitely. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Yeah. If they're the one and Indiana's the two, I think I like Villanova over Indiana. Mm-hmm. Um, Xavier's a three in Milwaukee, which, you know, that's, that's winnable for them. Um, yes. Kentucky's the one in the south. The south is in um, – Atlanta, I think? I believe it is in Atlanta. I know the Midwest is Kansas City. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that'd be a nice draw for them. Uh, Memphis, by the way. Oh, Memphis. Memphis that's right. Memphis. They, so, were, they were recently in Memphis, weren't they? I think so. That was in 2014? Yes. I want to say because I know – yeah, because Florida, cause Florida was in it, and so was uh, – so is Stanford, and so is Dayton, and so is uh, UCLA. And this is actually interesting. He has Butler in the 8-9 game again, which obviously they'd, they'd win and then give the one seed. Yep. A crazy game, but... As per the, as per the usual. Interesting part is he has them playing at Banker's Life. Hmm. So if Butler plays North Carolina at Banker's Life, I mean... <laughs> Stranger things? Yeah. Hey, exactly. Stranger things have happened. Um, that would that would certainly be interesting. Uh, also, has Seton Hall playing Wichita, which just another awful draw for Seton Hall. I guess Seton Hall's an eleven, though. I don't think they're going to be an eleven. No, I think that they're they're going to be much better than an eleven seed. The, at at the rate that they're going right now, they yeah. are going to do much better than an eleven. I mean, um, obviously, I think the one thing that could you know hurt Seton Hall, I guess, is their non... I, I, can't, actually, I can't even say that about their non-conference because their non-conference is actually pretty good. Yeah, it is. Um, Creighton going to Salt Lake to play Colorado is a six. Which, uh... I really like that matchup for Creighton. Yeah. And then Georgetown in the play-in game against BYU as a 12 and then playing Michigan State, but that mm. was before they lost, so... Yeah, exactly. So that's the bracket. Um, I think five or six teams will be where the Big East will be, maybe up to seven. Um, I agree. So, yeah, that's the bracket. Let's get to some questions. Yeah, Yeah, I was going to say, let's go to questions. I imagine you have the questions. I will go up to them now, yes. Um, yeah, so what else is happening lately while you find these questions? Let's see. Um, nothing really. Yeah, no, I was going to say, not, not too much. Um, let's see. Are you able to find them? Do you need me to find them for you? Well, I was just saying, I don't know, or I can't find where they where they even start. Well, let's see. It doesn't look like Probably yesterday, because we were going to do this yesterday. Problem is, we favorite too many things. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, I found it. Okay. I don't know if I'm going to ask these ones about Georgetown's coaching situation anymore, because... No, nah, probably... Wouldn't be necessary to do that. Not super applicable. Nope. I think my answer probably would have been John Thompson anyway. Um, and there's, yeah. there's only one guy that I think they could replace him with. And I talked about it on the Georgetown season preview yep. a couple months ago. Um, Mike Knapp wants to know if Miles Powell is the best player ever. Very good. Very good. Uh, much better contributor than I. Honestly, the Freshman of the Year award is race is going to be a lot of fun this year. I mean, last year yes. we all knew where it was going, probably from the first day of the season. Yeah, I mean, it was obviously, you know, cute, I guess you could say, to, you know, put Edmund Sumner and Jalen Brunson in that category, but it was certainly a Henry Ellenson's award to lose. Now Now the field is a lot, is a lot wider. So. And I think Player of the Year is going to be fun, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. 
Um, you know, if Angel Delgado keeps it up or, you know, Trayvon Blewett, um, Rodney Pryor could certainly be in there. Yep. And Obviously Josh Hart. Yeah. <clears throat> and Watson also. So. Yeah. yeah. Seeing so Villanova, interesting thing about them, just going back real quick, uh, Chris Jenkins really hasn't done much yet this year. No, he hasn't. So, <laughs> He's yet to really get it going. So I, when he gets it going, then, you know. Yeah. And Mikael Bridges is really good. Yeah. Um, all right, so back to the questions, because I know we have a really good one from Russ that actually ties into the week here. Even though it's not really a question, oh, Russ, yeah. I would like your Thanksgiving food power rankings on the podcast. Did not phrase it in the form of a question. We'll answer it anyway. Um, seems interesting, because I... Don't know. Are we just going like traditional Thanksgiving food? I mean, some people have macaroni and cheese. I've never had macaroni and cheese on Thanksgiving. I did last year. It was okay. Um, um, it was a little weird because, like you said, I don't. Use, I, I've never usually had it. So, I'm not a huge fan of turkey. Um, yeah, I'll eat it because it's Thanksgiving. But at least not the turkey you put in the oven. You know, if you're gonna smoke it or fry it, certainly tastes good. But if you just put it in the oven for four to six hours or whatever the heck it is that people do. Um, it, it's dry. I mean, but turkey's all right. Um, I think stuffing's probably at the top for me. A lot of ways you go with stuffing. Very versatile. Very tasty. Um, in terms of the two potatoes that you usually get, big fan of the mashed ones over the sweet ones. Sweet potatoes are weird because... They're already sweet, and then people put brown sugar and marshmallows on them. And, I'm, you know, it's – why? Why are you doing that? Yeah, that that is that is a little weird. I've never seen anyone do that, but I've heard of it. So uh, – Cranberries, big thing I'm into. Not the one that, like, slides out of the can and keeps the shape of the can. Actual cranberries. Yeah. Of uh, course. And then – your pies, um, can't really go wrong with either pumpkin or pecan. Nope. Um, I don't think I'm forgetting anything. Some people have green beans. Green beans are terrible. Um, yeah, so if you want to go ahead, that's not really power rankings, but I kind of ran them all down. You know, I, I, I pretty much would agree with most of the uh, opinions you shared there. Um I'm rolls are good. A lot of people have rolls. Yeah, but I like biscuits personally. Yeah. Um, biscuits are very good. Uh, I actually like turkey a lot, so I mm. think it's I'm, I think pretty highly highly of it. Um, mashed potatoes are really good, depending on if they're mat, regular potatoes or sweet potatoes. It doesn't matter to me. Um, like you said, actual cranberry sauce is very good, not the jelly kind that comes out of the can. It's very weird tasting and stuff like that. I don't know why people even bother with it. Um, yeah, no, I, I pretty much share the, most of the same opinions as you. I'm not going to be really controversial here. Uh, I do, I do think stuffing is the best Thanksgiving food though. By far. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, really, I think I like the turkey more the next day. You know, you put it on a sandwich with, uh, yes. stuffing, cranberry, exactly. throw it all together. Um, I know they did it on Friends or whatever. They had a name for it. I yeah. did it long before I saw the episode of Friends. Friends is not a very good show. Ooh, dropping controversy here. Um, yeah, so that's that's Thanksgiving. Um, not really any hot takes there. Nope. So that might be about it here. Yeah, I think that that would about do it here. So, if you want to play us off? Yes. Well, um, thank you for listening to the Big East Coast Podcast. We will probably be back next Monday, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you know, we got some more good stuff coming on the site. So, keep reading and uh, have a good Thanksgiving. Yep. So for Rob, I'm Chris, and we will see you next time.